Well, let's go ahead and kick off our roundtable discussion for today. I would like to welcome the over 300 individuals who registered for this thought leadership roundtable on lawyering peace. I'm Paul Williams, a professor of law and international relations at American University and the founder of the Public International Law and Policy Group, a global pro bono law firm that provides free legal assistance to parties involved in peace negotiations, drafting post-conflict constitutions, and prosecuting those responsible for atrocity crimes. Uh, I'm also the author of a recent book called Lawyering Peace, which examines the way in which parties have sought to build durable peace agreements. Uh, in order to, to write the book, I drew on the experience of many of my pro bono clients uh, that I've worked with around the globe on negotiating peace agreements. And I'm very excited today to be joined by three of my former uh, pro bono clients who've negotiated peace agreements and one of the world's most recognized uh, experts in mediation and conflict resolution. Today, the five of us will be discussing how best to negotiate and to design a durable peace agreement. Now, this event is part of our Thought Leadership Initiative, which focuses on prominent international law and international affairs topics and organizes monthly roundtables to share expertise and reflections from the work of PILPG around the globe. Today's discussion will be 60 minutes long. Uh, we ask that you drop any questions that you have into the Q&A and we will do our best to answer those either live uh, or in, in writing. Now, let me introduce our panelists. Quite frankly, it could take an entire hour just to review their, their bios. So I'm going to give you an abbreviated version of their expertise and their background. First off, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Alush Gashi, a signatory of the Declaration of Independence for the Republic of Kosovo, the former majority leader of the Parliament of Kosovo, and for over a decade and a half, the senior presidential advisor to President Rogova on foreign affairs. And, prioring to, and prior to entering the universe of foreign affairs, he served as the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Pristina. Alush, welcome to the round table. I also would like to give a hearty welcome to Mohammed El Tashi. Mohammed is a politician and the former member of the Sovereign Council of Sudan, the collective head of state for Sudan. He also served as the chief negotiator and main architect of the 2020 Juba Agreement for Peace in Sudan. He is a published author on various topics, including politics, demographic changes, peace and democratization in Sudan, and Mohammed is a senior peace fellow with the Public International Law and Policy Group, as is Alush. Mohammed, welcome to the roundtable. Thank also, you. Thank you, Mohammed. I'm also thrilled to introduce Vartan Oskanyan, the former Armenian Minister of Foreign Affairs from 1998 to 2008, and subsequently a member of the Armenian Parliament. Vartan served as Armenia's chief negotiator for the Nagorno-Karabakh Key West negotiations in 2001. Vartan, welcome to the roundtable. Good to be on, Paul. Great. And finally, I am honored to welcome Ambassador Kerry Kavanaugh, the professor of diplomacy at the University of Kentucky, the former chairman of the well-known London-based NGO International Alert, and during Kerry's time at the Department of State, he served as the ambassador and special negotiator for Eurasian conflicts. In this role, he was responsible for efforts to address ongoing and frozen conflicts in Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Moldova, and Tajikistan. He served as the co-chairman of the OSCE Minsk Group for Nagorno-Karabakh and was the architect of the peace talks between the presidents of Armenia and Azerbaijan in Key West, Florida in April of 2001. Kerry, welcome to the conversation. 
Pleasure to be here with you today. Great. Well, welcome everyone and thank you for agreeing to participate in today's panel and welcome to all of those of you who are dialing in for this conversation. Let me kick it off and jump right in. Carrie, let's turn to you first with a big picture question. As a mediator, what are the two most important things that you keep in the forefront of your mind when seeking to negotiate a durable peace? Okay. So you, you, this starts in a difficult point because it's always hard to limit it to two. Um, my son was a journalist for uh, NPR affiliates in the United States for a decade and just entered the U.S. diplomatic corps. But, you know, when you write stories, who, what, where, when, why, you get five. Let me do a real quick on three and then focus on two. Um, where, when, why are sort of uh, what, where, and when are process. Uh, what is, is it a ceasefire? Is it a definitive peace deal? Is it a temporary thing to move to another phase? Um, where is venue? What venue best supports that kind of talk you're looking for? And when, when are the parties most likely to be able to come together to move forward? But let me start with the fundamental ones, which is the beginning and the end, the who and the why. On the who, I think the, the most important thing mediators need to keep in mind is how do you craft a process that has everyone who needs to be engaged to get a solution involved in the process. And, and often people make a mistake here and they think that means seat at the table. Um, for a lot of the conflicts, uh, we've already brought up Kosovo, we brought up uh, Sudan, you would need an amazingly large table. Um, so it isn't everybody needs to be sitting there. The people who need to be sitting there are the people who can make definitive judgments to move it forward, but the process has to encompass the rest. So for a mediator, there's a responsibility that falls to you almost instantly. How do you make sure all those voices are heard and fed into the process and, and kept apprised of what's going on? And, and I think it's a challenge some people have a, a particular difficulty with because you're always thinking, oh, if I just bring these two sides together or three sides, um, you mentioned Nagorno-Karabakh. At one point, the discussions there in Key West, Armenia, Azerbaijan. At an earlier phase, Armenia, Azerbaijan, representatives of the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh and those authorities, representatives of the Azerbaijani community that had lived in Karabakh and, and, and their leadership. You craft the who with, the, with that aim of getting the right deal. And then let me focus a little bit on the why, the why. Often there's a challenge as you're in the process that the people engaged in the mediation get so focused on details of the deal, they, they lose sight of the, of the forest. Um, the trees leap out. Um, they're, they're upset about what if we move this line 100 yards? What if we have a provision here for another thousand people to be able to do this? Who's going to pay the bill to reconstruct the city that was destroyed by you? No, you just you destroyed it first, back and forth, back and forth. The challenge for the mediator is to keep bringing them back to the fact the deal, the solution, the ceasefire is a, a very much like a door. And everybody sees the door, you focus on the door, where's the handle, where's the hinges, how do you make it work, maybe you want to carve it in a particular style that's to your liking, but the door isn't really why you brought them together to have this talk, it's really what's beyond the door. And I, and I think the more you, as a mediator, can keep that focus, this deal's important, we're never saying it isn't, and the, and the minutia in it are important. But the real prize is when the door opens up, because then everything transforms. It's a whole different world. And, and I think those would be then the two I'd single out if I 
have to do this too is the most important. It's how do you get the people that you need engaged and how do you keep them focused on the ultimate prize? Well, Carrie, Carrie, you've you've given me flashbacks to <laughs> I think to our other panelists of all the times we've we've been in the room and they're really focused on a particular tree. And we keep pushing our chair back and saying, whoa, there's a whole forest of, of peaceful democratic transition to be to be thinking about. Well, speaking of almost peaceful democratic transition, uh, Mohammed, uh, let's turn to you. We've had Kerry's perspective from the mediation about you know, lessons learned and important points. Uh, you know, Mohammed, you were the, the chief negotiator for the Juba 2020 peace agreement in, uh, in Sudan or for Sudan. Now, in hindsight, what was your number one takeaway lesson that you would like to share about crafting a durable peace? And then a flip side corollary question, what do you now know ah, that you wish you would have known when you were negotiating the Juba peace agreement? Over to you, Mohammed. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. I'm very interested in listening to Gary, given his experience in a very specific uh, point that's really affected me and getting me back to this uh, Juba Peace Agreement in 2020. And if I had the chance to lay out this very crucial uh, le lesson that I learned from the Juba Peace Agreement negotiation, it's two things. Many things, in fact, but let me point these two things. Number one is the structure, that's the way the peace agreement being structured. Um, you know, we accepting the model of multiple track in, in one peace agreement, it makes it so difficult to implement it and it's making it so difficult for the public to understand it. And that's the main challenges we face it. Peace agreement without implementation and without public uh, awareness means nothing. You cannot implement it if the people, they don't know what this uh, peace agreement is about. So if I had the time again to go for a designing uh, peace agreement, I would not accept that in easy way. I understand, uh, Paul, you and I and the PLBG team working very hard to design the multiple track peace agreement is agreements for one agreement. But, um, and I understand the situation of Sudan, we coming from multiple parties, uh, negotiating in a multiple areas, uh, uh, hoping to achieve a one single uh, agreement. That is so difficult to deal with it. But I think I would rather spend the time to convince the party to come up with a one position other than um, and designing a, a multiple uh, uh, track agreement to, uh, to understand and to relocate the parties and the areas and come up with this a very complicated um, peace agreement. So that's one of the lessons. Number two, I think, um, is um, a, a a stakeholders engagement. If I have the time, I will not go for a direct negotiation before going for a full consultation with the stakeholders. How long does it take? It's, it's not matter, but I would make a concrete ground about the issues, about the stakeholders engagement, and will come up with uh, a heavy consultations to the uh, uh, negotiation table, and then uh, we can carry the parties to accept the will of the people as a stakeholder of this process. Unfortunately, the transitional period, because of it, this situation of the transition period itself, we don't have a time to do that. You know that the constitution um, said the transitional government should achieve a durable peace agreement in three months. So three months isn't that enough for the team negotiation to have a full time to consult with the stakeholders and then come back to the negotiation um, table. So if I had the time, I would not accept 
to go for the negotiation table without had a full consultation with um, stakeholders and make sure that the consultations uh, had had a free hand for the stakeholders to um, reflect with the problems and how to engage them, youth and administration natives, women and refugees, IDVs to be part of all this peace movement. Thanks, Mohammed. So I, I see a theme developing here, civilian inclusion and getting a comprehensive sense of what the real needs of a conflict environment are in a conflict afflicted population before moving in to design a durable peace. Well, now, Alush, let me turn to you. You spent decades of your life advising, successfully advising President Rogova on Kosovo's path towards self-determination and eventual uh, independence. What was the best piece of advice that you gave President Rogova that you would like to share with others involved in similar self-determination uh, movements or simply trying to build a durable peace in an environment where there are serious questions of the need for self-determination. Alush, over to you. Well, it was the uh, other way around because most of the time I was the one who needed advice from him. Uh, President Rugova was a uh, wise, humble, courageous leader who led a peaceful movement for freedom and independence through self-determination. Uh, our problems then were uh, problems which you deal in different chapters in your book. But then we did not have your book so we had to really work and do it hard way. We did it our way, which was later on internationally recognized as sui generis. Unfortunately, uh, Belgrade regime uh, did introduce a very severe apartheid in Kosovo. So by abusing us, uh, they really lost the right to govern Kosovo and its people. So we, uh, as an absolute majority, we decided to peacefully reject subjugation, commit to peaceful resolution through self-determination. Rugova's uh, extraordinary man in bringing people together, introduced inclusiveness in the entire process. Our basic commitment was that uh, we should do whatever we are able to do to proceed with peace, to save the lives of the people, and achieve our political goals through self-determination. So as a movement, we did reach that consensus that political goals have to be reached through peaceful means. So Rugova succeeded to create national dream. Since uh, core of our plight was peace, so peace for us became the strength. And in that one, uh, we were very successful to include everyone and make sure that everyone is equally responsible for national goal. We were aware that uh, our goal is not going to be accomplished by one action or one event. We were aware that this is a long process and we have to be constructive part of that process, which is still going on after 30 years, which reminds us that negotiation is a game of life and we have to be part of it. Our theme and now, then and now, 
is the same. Dialogue instead of conflict. My journey as a human rights and political activist has convinced me that we all have to work much harder on the places where conflict may happen. We should not wait for the invitation. We should share our knowledge and knowledge of our friends to offer modalities which may be able to avoid the war. Inclusiveness is the key to all those situations. We have to, or at least I strongly believe in power of mind. I strongly believe that it's needed to repeat as much as is needed that through inclusive negotiations, it's possible to avoid the war. And we have to educate people in need that negotiations are better before the war than to engage in the war and after disaster and consequences of the war start the process of negotiation. So if someone has uh, asked me for advice 30 years ago, the response will be the same like now. Get engage in inclusive dialogue as a process. Do not expect miracle in one action or in one event. So uh, Paul has uh, offered us the book and I'm really very grateful as a roadmap to solve most common issues. Three decades ago, we did not have that book. But fortunately, mm. we had your advice from days of apartheid, the days of freedom and independence, and now to strengthen and preserve our democracy. Thank you, Paul, with all your friends. Thank you, Lush, for those for those comments. Um, I can imagine that everyone listening is thinking, well, yes, inclusive and yes, you know, peaceful. But I can I can remember back when you, Alush, and President Rogova were pursuing the, the peaceful path towards self-determination, there was a huge amount of criticism and this and this real, real politic drift toward the use of force. And we see now in Sudan what the consequences are of, oh, well, let's use force and try to try to sort it out. Um, and so though it sounds fairly straightforward, I'll mention that it's exceedingly difficult to stick on the path of inclusiveness and on the path of, of peaceful. And we'll, we'll cycle back to, the, to this with, with you, Mohammed, with the fact that the civilians are being excluded from the ceasefire negotiations in, in Sudan at the moment. But while we're still on the topic of self-determination, let me turn to, to Vartan. Now, Vartan, you and Kerry came this close to reaching an agreement in Key West on self-determination for Nagorno-Karabakh and, and in a way that looked like it addressed the forest and it looked like what was beyond the door and, and in a durable peace, um, it failed uh, at the very last moment for, for one or two reasons. But today we're in a situation where there's an Azeri blockade of Nagorno-Karabakh the situation in Nagorno Karabakh is exceedingly, exceedingly tense. What and the Americans and others are are seeking to mediate uh, a settlement or design a structure. What lessons would you share that you learned in Key West and over your your decade as the Armenian Foreign Minister? What would you share with those today involved in trying to head off uh, a terrible situation in Nagorno Karabakh? Thank you, Paul. Interestingly, there are quite a few parallels between uh, the Key West talks and what's transpiring today 
in the Armenian Azerbaijani talks. Then Kerry was there, Paul yourself was there. Aliyev, Father Aliyev, uh, the father of Azerbaijan's current president, agreed that nagorno karabakh the whole territory, along with a corridor linking Karabakh to Armenia, will be given to Armenia's sovereignty. This Aliyev had agreed in at Key West. In return, Azerbaijan would have got a six meter wide two-way road that will connect Azerbaijan proper to their exclave Nakhichevan through Armenia. And that road was to be constructed as a overpass so that it does not interfere with any transportation and communication within Armenia. Well, at Key West, well, we were delighted that the talks are going in this direction and we will have a comprehensive solution to the conflict. At the same time, we were very suspicious that Aliva will be able to pull this off. It appeared to us then that this is too good to be true. And indeed, when Aliyev returned from Key West, having orally agreed to what we, you know, finalized at Key West, I think, let Kerry correct me, he called Kerry to Baku because Kerry was the leading negotiator there from the American side, and America had taken the initiative on this. He called him to Baku and said, I can't do this. So truly, that was an aberration then from the general pattern of talks. Today, we are in a similar situation in a reversed way. The tables have turned. Armenia's prime minister now agreed that nagorno karabakh is part of Azerbaijan. In return of simply getting some guarantees for the rights and security of the population of nagorno karabakh which as a result of this will become regular citizens of Azerbaijan. Now the tables have turned and this is too good to be true for Azeris, because what the prime minister is doing will not lead to a durable peace. I think he's acting under duress, under threat of war. Azeris are impressing upon him this kind of a solution. In my view, prematurely and against the will of the people of nagorno karabakh and the people of Armenia conceding this particular item accepting that nagorno karabakh can be part of Azerbaijan will not lead to anywhere. The key here, Paul, as you keep emphasizing, is durable peace, right? When you engage in negotiation, your goal and your target needs to be achieving the durable peace. You, PILPG, lately put out a memorandum on armenian azerbaijani talk and you, therefore, very rightly make the following argument, which I fully agree with. One, that the bare discussion of those two existential issues, right and security guarantees, those discussions in a vacuum will be, you know, elusive. That will not lead to durable peace. The only possibility that Armenians and Azeris have today is to bring those two items within a broader context. And that context is the right of the people of nagorno karabakh for self-determination. And you say there that the people of nagorno karabakh at the minimum have the right for internal self-determination. Indeed, the only discussion that Armenian and Azeris can have today to achieve a durable peace, whether the people of Karabakh have the right for internal self-determination or external. Azeris will insist on internal, Normally, that needs to be the pattern, autonomy within Azerbaijan. nagorno karabakh and Armenia, frankly, have the right to insist on external self-determination because the way Azeris have behaved during the Soviet times and after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and most particularly today, what's happening in nagorno karabakh they're under total blockade for more than seven, eight months now, and they are at the verge of starvation. 
and recently the former prosecutor of International Criminal Court Ocampo, Luis Moreno Ocampo, put out a statement saying that this particular act creating the conditions around the Gornogarapak people which could lead to their starvation and mass elimination is an act of genocide. So taking all this account in account, Garapa people have the right for external, but we need to sit down and talk with Azeris within this context and self-determination has to be one of the guiding principle for reaching a peaceful resolution. Again, I will come back to the key word, durable peace and carries two items, why and who. Garapa people need to engage along with Armenia and Azeris in these talks, and the why has to be what could truly lead to a durable solution. Kerry, in that why, we are all students of negotiations. We know the basic principle of it. Don't focus on position, focus on interest. We need to transcend the current position. Yes, Azeris have won the war, but that doesn't mean that they can violate all sorts of human rights and what have you. They cannot simply ignore the fact that the Garapa as a territory and people never been part of independent Azerbaijan. During the Soviet times, they had autonomous status. And during the past 30 years after the collapse of Soviet Union, they actually had a de facto independent you know, entity. So all these taking into consideration, I believe going back to Kerry's why we need to transcend position and focus on interest. And that interest must be how to reach a durable peace, not a quick fix that will eventually lead again sometime in the future to another war between Armenians and Azeris. Great, thank you. Thank you, Vartan. Um, let's now move to Kerry. And as, as both Vartan and I, I noted, the, the piece that you had designed at Key West um, was by, by all accounts, one that would have led to a durable agreement. It didn't play out for various reasons. Um, what advice would you be giving now to the parties to, to resolve the current crisis and to head off future conflict between Azerbaijan and and Armenia. Well, let me let me excuse me. Let me jump to something that Luce raised, and I think it's sort of key of what's happened here, and and, and it's the how. Um, you can only get durable peace through peaceful political negotiations, and I and I think there's been a short sightedness in Baku, and I've said this for the past three years. You can't solve this problem militarily. Uh, President Aliyev, and, and I understand why he says it, but we repeatedly comment, well, I've solved that problem. You know, we've solved it with guns. We've solved it with bombs. Uh, that doesn't. It has all kinds of ramifications directly to the people involved in the region and for the future of Azerbaijan and the future of the region and Azerbaijan's future relations with everyone else. And we see some of this at play already. Uh, Luis, uh, who, who I know well, is you know is looking at this question of genocide. This okay. is a national reputation Azerbaijan wants to have. We're talking about the situation regarding about 120,000 people currently in Karabakh. Azerbaijan's going to sacrifice its future relations with all the countries of the world sacrifice its reputation as a violator of human rights, as a perpetrator of war to, to gain political objectives. For that, that, that doesn't make sense. The, the logic has been and always was sit at the table and work it out. And it was something his father recognized. And, and I think indeed it's something he recognized early on and in frustration or whatever else went down this military path. But 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 that's a key part of, of the challenge here. Um, this There won't be a set, if everyone in Karabakh has to leave, 
this problem has not been resolved. It isn't resolved militarily. It's like a thousand other little lines on maps around the world waiting to reemerge, come in a different way. And, and I think that highlights a, an issue that mediators are always sensitive to, and it's the one of timing. And, and you need to be very careful on that. And when moments come for peace, and we've seen them happen, and we've seen success on that, you have to grab them. Um, we came close in Key West. Um, indeed, earlier, there was a even closer in a way situation um, before the assassinations in the Armenian parliament. I, I think that week, uh, already we saw great promise and a long-lasting durable solution. But that window got partially closed with those killings and put a nervousness into the process that continued all the way through Key West. Um, so there is a timing thing in here. There's a method thing in here. And, and I think the message to, to Azerbaijan remains, you can't solve this militarily. You, you've got to have a different approach. And, and I think for the rest of the world, it's a, it's a tricky time with Ukraine and other things going on to give this all the attention it deserves. That situation won't always hold. There will be a time, there will be a price to pay if you're too heavy handed in how you implement policies. Um, we brought up repeatedly the role both the uh, Mohammed brought this up to, you know, before and after, get public involved, have the public engaged. Um, can't solve it just militarily. You can't solve things simply diplomatically either. It, it's a sort of whole of world effort, but you need NGOs involved. You need them involved early if you can prevent the conflict from coming about. You need them involved after. And we see even here, even the sort of most accepted NGOs around the world, International Committee for the Red Cross, are being blocked from addressing this problem in the Gorn Karabakh. You know, this doesn't work. They've 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 gone into what Russians call a tupik, a cul-de-sac, a dead end, and they really need to stop and pause and look at what they're doing. Well, thank you, Kerry and, and Barton, for, for giving us some insights on a conflict that we wake up every day and, and read about uh, on the uh, on the front page of the uh, of the newspaper. Uh, and also the shout out to Moreno Ocampo. International law does play <laughs> a role <laughs> at some time uh, in peace versus justice or peace with justice. Uh, but sticking with the theme of militarization of, of these processes, um, Mohammed, let me turn it to you and, and pick up a question that Brahana Meskel Nega, uh, who's also a senior peace fellow with PILPG, uh, has put into the uh, the Q&A. And it's it's similar to the question that that I had in mind, which is when you and I were sitting in your in your garden in Khartoum, you were you were on the Sovereign Council. And I, I very impolitely asked you <laughs> if you were worried about counter revolutionary forces. You know, what, what a great way to to uh, ruin a lovely evening in the in the garden, uh, but to ask about the possibility of the counter revolution, and you were completely clear eyed, and you said, "I worry about it every hour of every day." Um, and it turns out you were you were prescient. There was there was the the counter revolution. There there was the coup, um, turned back the Juba peace agreement, and then the coup led to this flight fight between the Sudan armed forces and the rapid support forces. Which is now essentially terrorizing all of all of Sudan. Um, how and why did that happen? Uh, and as um, Rahana Meskel asked, what could have been different to guard against that counter revolution that you can keep in mind as we hopefully negotiate Sudan back onto a democratic path? So the easy question for you, Mohammed. Well, it's a very easy question, and it's, what it's a forward question, honestly, but it is a key question of the whole Sudan's future. Um, um, uh, look, um, 
57 years out of 67 years of the Sudan independence period being occupied by the military. So the main, the main question um, remained the same. Is the army institution really capable to handle together with the civilians a successful um, transitional period that can lead us to the democratic uh, state, that's the main question. My answer now is no. And that is part of my worry when I came to the uh, the office. Um, I remember the first meeting in the Sovereign Council. Um, when I attend that meeting, I've seen um, loving members, six of them are civilians, five are must senior um, uh, uh, commands on the army. And I discovered that meeting, there is ongoing differences and a deep differences between these two heads of the military, Burhan and Hemete. And that get me worried during the uh, transition uh, period. I had a long conversation with both of them. And my, my assessment hasn't changed since then. And it is very clear now, if the Sudanese people got to achieve a democratic state and a stable uh, political uh, situation, they got to go for establishing a new army in this country without agreement on establishing a single new army in the country, we cannot guarantee both the democratic state or even the single united country. Now come to my conclusion in this in this in these issues. Um, I think I had a chance to meet with General Burhan for one hour and a half after one year and a half after the 25th of October coup, when we get started the political process that's hoping to sign a political agreement can restore the democracy back on the track. And thus, one hour and a half, fully of advice, fully of frank conversation between him and I. When I remember that conversation now, every single word he had said on that meeting was a lie. So the main problem here is the leaders of the military never been in a good face and made their commitment when it comes to handling the power to the democratic elected civilian government. And that's not the problem of Burhan. That's the problem of entire uh, Sudanese army leaders through 67 years since the independence of the country. And the issues of the commitment and the issue of the principles it's not the issue of the leaders, it is the issue of the institution. The institution in Sudan, the army institution in Sudan, designed it in the first place after the, uh, uh, the, the, the British left the country to control the power and the walls. And it is now remaining the same. They controlling the power, you know this. They controlling the wells, you know this. And we cannot drive in a country, a democratic country in Sudan without getting back the power, the political process and getting back the wars to the Sudanese people. Does require establishing a new single army to be a key answer of the democratic process in this country. Thanks, Mohammed. That's that's something that I think we're all focusing on is how do we create a a single army subject to civilian control 
uh, through the, whatever the next round of, of negotiations might might look like. And as a number of folks have put in the Q&A, that civilian participation in ceasefire negotiations and inclusive participation, including, including gender inclusivity, is crucial to actually make the security sector reform, the DDR, demilitarization, demobilization, and reintegration successful. Now, Alush, speaking of talking to military uh, <laughs> commanders in Sudan, uh, <laughs> I know that you've been heavily involved, Alush, in sharing your experiences uh, with the key actors uh, in Sudan um, and previously have, have spoken with a number of the key uh, military and militia leaders in Sudan. Would you like to share with us um, you know, sort of what you've been doing, what you've learned, and you know, what, what you've been telling, whatever's not confidential, what, what you've been sharing with? The protagonists in Sudan in order to get them to a negotiating table and to stop the fighting? Uh, I was really very much honored to, to meet uh, such a, a good group of quality people on the military and civilian part, especially civil society. Uh, personally, I do not see Sudan as a hopeless because they have quality people, uh, they uh, in the last uh, four or five years, they have uh, really publicly demonstrated that uh, they are committed to change. Uh, only thing which I can uh, share with them is that uh, I'm not uh, going to judge what they should do. I try to share uh, what we did as a, as a tiny nation. We. We were aware that uh, we need support. I believe uh, Sudan is aware of that. They need support. But the way we did it, that uh, we were uh, open to, to listen to our friends. We were open to engage in that. We were open to, to accept the idea of uh, compromise. We were open to uh, accept the idea of unpopular and hard decisions. Mm. And uh, I, uh, I cannot uh, really advise those smart uh, people who run their offices. But my reading from distance is that uh, this really doesn't make sense. The two generals, the president and vice president, and two leaders and patriots fight each other. Uh, in theory or in practice, uh, what will bring? More killings, more disasters, and in the end, they will sit and talk and find some solution. So, my uh, loud thinking is uh, begging that uh, they should demonstrate leadership and recognize that they have to stop the war. To stop the war, they can do it. And there is no negotiation without very inclusive negotiation team. The country who has suffered so much the country who has uh, people who for years protested on the street asking for freedom. Over there, torch of freedom is alive. So it's time to bring those people to the table. And uh, it's not the guilt just the military. The political parties have to really invest a lot to get developed as political parties. And they have to, uh, if I may say, uh, uh, hear more for the country. Those days, everybody was speaking about the election, but no one was ready for the election. Neither military, neither leaders of political party, because they have no infrastructure. If you, if you ask, well, let's have an election in six months, they say, oh, no, we are not ready for two years. So, uh, and then uh, I think Western uh, uh, democracies, if they did work a little bit closely with the needs, when uh, transition started, 
uh, maybe military would not turn to different proxies left and right, to different autocratic regimes, and then introduce the different interests over there. So maybe they will follow the interests of people of Sudan. And I strongly believe that uh, uh, people who have expertise on, uh, on the needs of the people, which are very basic, the human rights need. There is no general who has a right to take that from anyone. And uh, so I communicate still with them in written form, almost in daily base. And I just hope that uh, they're aware that uh, no one can win this war. And uh, they have not been attacked for any of the countries so the military should be in military barracks. The peace should be run by its civilian structures. So I, uh, I can pray and beg that uh, they introduce white table with overwhelming majority of civilians taking responsibility for way forward. No, Lush, I, I think you're right. Sometimes these conflicts and then the process for getting to a ceasefire legitimizes the illegitimate military actors as representatives of, of the country. And they forget about mm -hmm. the 96% of the country that are that are civilians. And so it's helpful for, for individuals like yourself to be constantly reminding the military leaders they don't actually represent the population. Well, Vartan, let me turn to you with a, a question and then, then Carrie, I'm going to turn to you with a, a question that's in the Q&A about the, the background and the nature of, of mediators. Uh, Vartan, when you've been faced with challenges and trying to get to pragmatic and enduring solutions, what strategies have you used or do you recommend that peace builders use to, to overcome these challenges and to really focus on a on a durable piece. When everyone's like, oh, let's just get to yes, it doesn't really matter if it's durable. How do you push through that challenge to, to negotiate something that will actually work? What does your experience tell us? Well, Paul, one of the things I've always done, I put myself in the shoes of the other side. So whenever I would say something or suggest something, I always be considerate of how that will be perceived by the other side. Because I understood that you cannot force your position on the other side during negotiations and there has to be all sorts of trade-offs. So that was one of the key principles that I you know, worked with. The other one, as I already mentioned, always focused on the broader interest. Look what's happening today, Algerians are very focused on position. What is the position? They're the victors. Armenia is the vanquished. We want to impose our will. Every conflict eventually ends with negotiations. But the key here for a successful negotiation, as the victor, how sees the essence of that negotiation? If he's coming to those talks to impose capitulation on the other side, this will not lead to durable peace. But if you come to negotiations with a good faith that eventually as a neighboring country, we are going to live in this region together, generations will work together. We both will thrive, survive and prosper. Then that will give you a totally different perspective to the talks. Unfortunately, as a Bajani position today, is not even close to what I just described. They're very arrogant, they're very petulant, and also they're very aggressive. They're surrounding Armenia from different places. They have their military on a standby and everything. They do not get something at the negotiating table. They provoke something and encroach upon Armenia. I fully agree with Kerry that there is no military solution to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. 
it can only be a temporary fix, which will not last. We got to transcend this position and we got to put the whole process within the context of human rights, self-determination, and also focus on durable peace. These are applicable to current situation in Garapah, as I someone who's been involved in negotiations for decades and also have followed other processes such as Kosovo very closely, I would say that this is a general principle that can be applied across the board. Thank you, Vartan. Uh, let me now turn back to you, Carrie, with uh, pulling a question from the uh, question and answer stream, which is how important or not uh, is it for a mediator to be a part of the community in conflict with the knowledge of relevant language, cultures, histories, or does being an outsider bring particular benefits to the mediation process? What are your thoughts on that? And you're on mute, Carrie. Sorry about that. I'm silencing myself. That's a good thing for a diplomat. Listening oh. is really important, as George Mitchell used to always say. Um, I, I think this is there's a there's a debate on this all the time, and it has no real solution. There's no doubt. Greater knowledge of the region, the people, the history, the culture, the languages makes a lot of things easier. Um, even when we've been talking about Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, we had a lingua franca in Russian. People didn't speak sufficient English, then you spoke Russian, and, and, and that would work. So it was helpful. But, but I think that gets counterbalanced by sort of mediator skill sets that people develop. And, and those center not so much on regional knowledge, but on how you engage with people. In a, in a sense of how you move things diplomatically forward. I, I mentioned George Mitchell, he's a perfect example. Uh, working on Good Friday Agreement, George, um, you know, Senator Mitchell was not a, a Northern Ireland expert. He didn't know that, but he dealt with uh, people in Congress making deals for decades. And he knew how to listen to what are your concerns, sort through it and, and, and work that out. I had worked for a while on the Cyprus conflict, and I had followed a man, a quite capable diplomat, one of our strongest diplomats even, who had served in Greece, had served in Turkey, had served in Cyprus, do both languages. On paper, he looked perfect and was able to get nowhere with the parties. And I remember when I started the job, I was warned by our ambassador in Cyprus, we're going to go over and see Rauf Dinktash, the, the Turkish leader of Northern Cyprus. And it's going to be about three hours as he walks you through the history of the birthplace of Aphrodite all the way to the current day. And I walked into that room and Dinktash turns to me and goes, oh, I've heard so much about you. I've talked to our friends in Ankara. I've talked to our friends in Athens. Uh, we don't need to talk about these things. Pose for pictures with the photographers. Threw them all out and instantly started talking. So to him, no, that wasn't key. What was key is sort of what do you bring to the table? And, and, and I think that part's important. And I know we're running out of time, but I saw there was a question about women. And I wanted to note, I had been the token male on a delegation with... Uh, Dame Margaret Anesty and Elizabeth Rain, who had been a defense minister in Finland, to the UN. We did UN NATO OSCE, lobbying for four more female mediators. Everywhere we went, oh, yes, of course, if we need to do this. Uh, no change. It's a challenge. I think we need to keep working on it. We need to increase the pool in, in that way, and, and that becomes key. Thank you, Carrie. For, thank you for sharing those for sharing those thoughts. Um, we do. We will be um, wrapping up. I just wanted to say that it's been a a real honor uh, for me to be able to to host this roundtable 
uh, with four really good friends and, and four individuals who dedicated in some or all of, of their life to, to conflict resolution, to finding ways to, to move from the guys with guns to an inclusive civilian process and, uh, and build a durable peace. And I know for myself, uh, for those that are watching the round table, um, and for my for my students, there are a number of my students who are who are watching this round table as well. It's inspiring to know that that there are people in this world who literally dedicate their lives to trying to to resolve conflict and to um, to make the world uh, have more durable democracies and uh, more durable environments for people to 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 live and and enjoy their protected protected human rights. So. A real heartfelt thank you from from me to to the four of you for all of the wonderful work that you've done throughout your lives and for sharing your your thoughts this last this last hour. Um, I would like to to end with a, a note of advertisement to our audience. Our our next all female panel uh, will be on the International Criminal Court's Office of the Prosecutor's Policy on Gender Persecution, a topic that PLPG has been deeply engaged in over this uh, past year. Uh, it'll be next week, September 15th at 12 p.m., and you can register it through the same system that you registered for, for this panel, and I, uh, I hope to see you there. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and thank you, Vartan, Kerry, Mohammed, and Lush for sharing your insights. Thank you, Paul.